शिवंग मैडम आर यू रेडी Yes, sir. I think we should start. People will keep joining. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good of good evening, everyone. Indian Nurse Women Association 58th webinar. Me, me. All the participants. Ka, thay dil se swagat karta hu. Aaj jo hamara 8th webinar hone ja raha hai. That is on emerging bio fertilizer and bio control strategies for nurseries. इसमें मार्गदर्शन करने के लिए हमारे साथ आज डॉक्टर एम बी देश पांडे सर जुड़े हुए इज द फॉर्मर चीफ साइंटिस्ट इज ऑल्सो डिरेक्टर ऑफ ग्रीन वेंशन बायोटेक प्राइवेट लिमिटेड उड़ी कांचन तो मैं डॉक्टर देश पांडे सर का इंडियन नर्सरीमैन के एसोसिएशन की ओर से स्वागत करता हूँ सभी पार्टिसिपेंट्स का आज के इस वेबिनार में स्वागत आप सभी लोग जानते हैं कि बायो फर्टिलाइजर का रोल दिन ब दिन बढ़ते जा रहा है और नॉट इन वन इन नर्सरीज लेकिन अभी जो फार्मिंग हो रहा है उसमें भी बहुत बड़े पहनावे पे बायो फर्टिलाइजर्स और बायो कंट्रोल की स्ट्रेटेजीज बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है तो उसी क्षेत्र में मार्गदर्शन करने के लिए आज हमारे साथ डॉक्टर एम पी देश पांडे सर जुड़े हुए हैं सर का प्रेजेंटेशन चालू होने के पहले मैं इंडियन नर्सरीमैन एसोसिएशन के जो हमारे प्रेसिडेंट है वाई सिंह साहब उनका तय दिल से शुक्रिया अदा करूंगा कि जिन्होंने हम हमें इस वेबिनार सीरीज में बहुत बड़ा मार्गदर्शन किया है और ये सीरीज कंटिन्यूसली चल रही है आईने की बहुत सारी एक्टिविटीज दिन ब दिन बढ़ती जा रही है और उसका संक्षिप्त लोक जो का आप सभी के सामने पेश करने की हमारी शिवंगी मैडम से रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ कि इंडियन नर्सरीमैन एसोसिएशन की जो भी एक्टिविटीज है वो सभी पार्टिसिपेंट के साथ शेयर की जाए ओवर टू यू शिवंगी मैडम गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन थैंक यू सर आई जस्ट स्टार्ट शेयरिंग Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Please go ahead. Uh, before I begin with the presentation, I would like to mention a few lines about the founder of Indian Nursery Men Association, late Sri Arjun Das Agarwal. He was the founder of Indian Nursery Men Association and our first president. He founded the organization in the nineteen eighty seven. Our current president is Mr. Y. P. Singh, and he is the ninth president of Indian Nursery Men Association. He has also served as a treasurer from two thousand six to two thousand eight, and further as a general secretary from two thousand eight till eleven. Mr. Singh started his career as a horticulturist and further established the iconic nursery, which is situated in Delhi. And um, Mr. Singh is the vital organ and a link between leaders and policy makers within the country. Uh, the Indian Nursery Men Association has representation from various parts of the country. 
we have our green ambassadors. The Indian Nurserymen Association is a registered non-governmental organization and it is a lifetime committee member of Confederation of Indian Horticulture under the National Horticulture Board. It has completed 33 years of its establishment and as of now we have around more than 3,700 members who are our lifetime members as well. The INA truly represents the entire horticulture industry, plant breeders, greenhouses and nursery growers retailers, distributors, students, educators, and other stakeholders. The organization strives to be influential advocates, and it maintains the connection and clout needed to impact legislative and regulatory decisions. It strives to be authoritative educators, collaborative across the industry, be fervent supporters of plant businesses, and passionate promoters of healthy and green communities. The organization is governed by an elected board of governing council of 11 members. The GC makes major decisions pertaining to the operation of the association and establishes policies to carry out the INA's objectives. The thematic areas of Indian Nursery Men Association could be understood as uh, PR and advocacy, networking and partnerships, capacity building and study tour, research and development, events and exhibitions, publication and papers. During the COVID pandemic uh, in the last year, the Ministry of Agriculture discussed about the problems with the plant nursery sector is facing due to the lockdown and other consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. INA was in regular contact with the ministry and since lockdown was advocating them in regard to with the hardships. Mr. White is saying the president of INA is stylishly pushing the agenda for the upliftment of nursery sector through National Horticulture Board and he has also submitted several proposals to bring mainly financial schemes for the nursery sector. The nursery sector in India has a tremendous potential to be at global standard for being leader as an international export. However, our green sector is facing many problems in order to survive uh, due to the pandemic. Advocacy with the National Horticulture Board and the demands by IELA to the government of India. Some of them are uh, national service should be conducted by NHP, setting up of four international standard nursery hubs, development of research and development centers, important role in process of horticulture export council of India, development of training centers for people from nursery, garden and landscape sector. The INA has also proposed establishment of flower and export council of India under Ministry of Agriculture. Ministry of Agriculture under the under Export Promotion Council approved the formation of plants and flower, flowers and plants export council of India, which is going to be an autonomous body. Our membership is now available um, throughout the world in countries apart from India, like Japan, Vietnam, Lebanon, South Africa, Netherlands, Italy, Colombia, Bangladesh, and many more. We have our publication, nursery monthly nursery today magazine, and Directory for Horticulture Industry, which is published on every three years. And we have our C for Future webinar series. INA has hosted more than 56 webinars on different subjects with more than, 5, 000, with more than 4,500 participants. INA hosts Hortipro India, which is India's largest international exhibition of ornamental plants, nursery, landscape, floriculture, greenhouse, arboriculture, and allied industries. These are some of the pictures from the show. Recently, on World Environment Day, the Indian Nursery Men Association carried out plantation drives in various parts of the country in collaboration with some of the stakeholders. Thank you. Over to you, Sachin Jai. Thank you, Shivangi, madam. जैसे आप लोग जानते हैं कि 58 वेबिनार है हमारा वेरी एक्सेलेंट टॉपिक दैट इज ऑन इमर्जिंग बायो फर्टिलाइजर एंड बायो कंट्रोल स्ट्रेटजीज फॉर नर्सरीज आज इस महत्वपूर्ण टॉपिक में मार्गदर्शन करने के लिए हमारे साथ डॉक्टर मुकुंद देशपांडे सर जुड़े हुए हैं देशपांडे सर वाज अ फॉर्मर चीफ साइंटिस्ट एट सीएसआर एनएस एनसीएल पुणे ही इज आल्सो डायरेक्टर Green Vention Biotech Private Limited, Uroli Kanchan. Sir has obtained his PhD in 1982 in biochemistry 
and Doctor of Science in Microbiology of the University of Pune in 1994. He has been working extensively on the use of fungi and fungal products, especially in the agriculture biotechnology. Sir has successfully completed more than 35 research projects funded by the national and international funding agencies for the development of mycosynthesis, biopesticide, fungal morphologies, as in byproducts. To the name of name of you, he has developed three technologies useful in agriculture for the pest and pathogen control and licensed them for his own startup Green Venture Biotech located in Uruli Kanchan, Pune. He has to his credit more than 150 research paper, reviews and chapters, nine patents, eight books and a number of popular articles. Sir is an elected fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and Society of Bio for Biocontrol Advancement. So today we have a very knowledgeable and experienced person, Dr. Deshpande sir. I welcome him on behalf of Indian Nurserymen Association and I request Deshpande sir uh, to give a very important uh, presentation on the topic of emerging biofertilizers and biocontrol strategies for nurseries. So over to you, Deshpande, sir. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I don't, I don't know whether I deserve this one, but still, uh, it will be my pleasure, and always it is my pleasure to associate with Nurserymen Association. So shall I start share the screen now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. It is visible, no? Okay. Yes, sir. Just a second. I'll just shift this. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I have one very small favor from you that if at all, because it is eight o'clock, so if at all you want to eat something, you just switch off your video and you can eat. Otherwise, it will, will it will be disturbing for me and because I will also feel hungry. Anyway, uh, jokes apart, uh, today I thought that maybe this will be a good opportunity for me to discuss with you about the what are the different emerging trends where we can use biofertilizer and biocontrol strategies, especially for organic nurseries. Uh, there are six primary nutrients which we are at present using carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and of course, three additional nutrients that matter like calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and of course, micronutrient, boron, copper, iron, molybdenum, zinc, manganese, etc. So these are the nutrients which are directly consumed by the plant. So I can say that these are the direct biofertilizers for the plants, but, and these fertilizers are necessary for the plant to have the long duration release or slow release of these fertilizers and there are certain uh, polymers which are using which are being used to really slowly release this such type of fertilizers uh, one is the rice biochar uh, which is based on copolymer coated urea this is the ex ex excellent release behavior of 65.2 28% nutrient leaching on the 27, 22nd day. That means the total 40% is released in 20, uh, uh, 22 days. And such type of slow release is also important and is can be achieved with polyvinyl pyrrolidine, pyrrolidine and other coating materials. But uh, there are certain indirect biofertilizers also where the microorganisms do this role. Instead of giving the material directly to the plant, these microorganisms, they also slowly release such type of uh, uh, elements which are being used by the plants. For example, nitrogen. Nitrogen is fixed by two different organ, two types of different organisms, symbiotic and non-symbiotic. Symbiotic is, of course, with leguminous plants, but non-symbiotic are important like azotobacter, clostridium, klebsiella, nostoc, benzerinca, etc. 
phosphorus solubilization is another aspect which is uh, which is being done by different bacterial systems like bacillus megatherium bacillus at least bacillus circular so these are the organisms which are being used for the nitrogen fixation phosphorus solubilization phosphorus mobilization especially fungal organisms like mycorrhiza and nowadays my, mycorrhiza is a uh, mycorrhizal association also picking up and uh, uh, also playing important role in the nursery biofertilizer for micronutrients <coughs> like silicate and zinc solubilizers and bacillus is one of the important organisms which is involved in zinc solubilization and pgpr activity is shown by pseudomonas fluorescence where different pseudorophores etc are released which can control different pathogens and also uh, as uh, also plant growth promoting substances and there are certain fungal organisms like trichoderma metarhizium these are also used <coughs> for the uh, for above mentioned activities but one organism which i specifically mentioned that this is the important organism but i have not seen that anybody is directly using this organism that is gluconoacetobacter diazotrophicus actually this is an endophyte isolated from sugarcane and also reported from different crops like uh, coffee ragi pineapple and rice but besides nitrogen fixation this organism also produces different plant growth promoting substances and nowadays i think this organism can serve a lot of purpose in the uh, nursery phosphorus mobilization or solubilization or physical detachment these are carried out by different organisms like bacillus bacillus is one of the important organism of course pseudomonas is another organism which can also do the same function now about the mycorrhiza this association i mean i was just going through the literature uh, that around 50000 fungal species have such type of interaction uh, with plant species and uh, so many plants please like 2 lakh 50000 plant species have mycorrhizal association that is this is a symbiotic association there are two types of mycorrhizal association which is ecto and endo micro association and this association is important and it increases the longevity of feeder roots surface area of roots in turn naturally the rate of absorption of major and minor nutrients also increased and selective absorption of uh, phosphorus zinc and copper has been seen as well as calcium potassium etc so these are the elements which are necessary for plants and mycorrhiza association is uh, is critically giving this to the plant Uh, the, there are couple of organisms which can be grown actually this is obligate symbiotic association but there are couple of mycorrhizal organisms like uh, uh, solithus and uh, thelephora these are the two uh, organisms this can be grown in the laboratory in the liquid fermentation and can be used uh, uh, for the plant growth or can be used in the uh, uh, pots uh, along with vermiculite and can be useful for the plant so, but mycorrhizal association is essentially a symbiotic association so we have and host specificity is there so we have to identify newer and newer organisms for the uh, growth of the better growth of the plant uh, compost and vermi compost is uh, important and everybody knows about this that the nitrogen phosphorus potash calcium etc all the, and other micronutrients are also given by the vermi compost Uh, there are plant growth promoting activities of different fungal organisms and for example metarhizium whenever we talk about metarhizium we think only that it is having bio control activity or control of insect pest is uh, can be achieved using metarhizium but this species like metarhizium anisoplay can be used it has endophytic activity it can be used for the promotion of the tomato plant growth also it has uh, endophytic association with root hairs in case of beans while uh, we have uh, we have seen in national chemical laboratory that metarhizium anisoplay increases nodulation in peanut and there are different enzyme activities which are necessary for the nodul nodulation uh, on the on the leguminous plants and that we call it as node factor and such type of node factor related enzymes are produced by metarhizium anisoplay and this is one of the observations we uh had in uh, in national chemical laboratory and we can use this organism for soil application also while bavaria baseana an another organism uh, which is insect pathogenic fungus it can also promote strawberry plant growth and health 
Trichoderma is a wonder organism, we say, and Trichoderma herzianum is, is important as far as the plant uh, um, control of the pathogens is concerned, as well as it produces uh, and gives, increases the plant host de defense responses. And also it increases the yield of different plants. And you will find that in cotton, 300% yield, if we apply Trichoderma in the soil, we can find that 300% increase in the yield. While potato, rice, maize, and strawberry, we get around 90% increase. And other chickpea, groundnut, etc., 120 to 170% increase. So this plant growth promoting activity, in addition to their biocontrol activity, that one we are going to see later, these organisms are important. <clears throat> uh, when we talk about biocontrol, there are two different aspects. One is the microbials and another one is the plant-based. In plant, whenever we talk about plant-based, it is a neem products. And you will see the big list of neem products, neem insecticide, pesticide, paste fumigant, fertilizer, etc. And azadirectin is the important uh, component in uh, neem seed. And there are different target pests uh, which can be controlled using the neem extract, neem seed extract that American ballworm, ants, locust, leaf hopper, leaf miners, mice, etc. Uh, one product is there now in the market also, and we are also working on this, that's a fish oil rosin soap with cinnamon oil. This is important, especially for nursery, and we have also done some trials, and we find that the it can control very well white fly, mealybug, and other insects. In addition to neem, there are all different plants, plant species, which produce insecticidal uh, uh, chemicals like custard apple, for example, from its seeds and leaves, we can see that a lot of insecticidal chemicals are produced which can control caterpillars, etc. And uh, just to give the little different story about this custard apple, we have our own uh, uh, 50 isolates of metarhizium, and we find that the isolates from the custard apple field are more virulent than the isolates from the uh, other fields like the host plants for helicoverba, for example, tomato or um, brinjal or any other thing. We find that the when we isolate uh, this type of metarhizium strains from the host plants of helicoverba, we are not getting that much effectiveness while the custard apple isolates, that means isolates from the soil from custard apple, we find that they are very effective. And this is because there is a horizontal gene transfer. I mean, this I just don't want to go into more details, but there is a possibility of transfer of insecticidal traits uh, from the custard apple into metarhizium. And thus we get the metarhizium strains which are very effective in the field. Basil, chilies, garlic, all these are the plants of ginger, papaya, tobacco. They have a lot of insecticidal chemicals produced, metabolites are there, insecticidal metabolites are there. So you can certainly use such type of extract, plant extracts for the control of different pests. Under microbials, everybody knows about the use of microorganisms. Uh, when we talk about the control of helicoverpa or any uh, insect pest, everybody knows about the bacillus thuringiensis and viruses. NPV is another virus which is which also controls helicoverpa, sporoptera, etc. Uh, but the problem with bacteria and viruses is that they are effective when they are ingested by the insect pest, while in case of fungal organisms, fungi act by contact and that is the advantage why metarhizium, bivaria, etc. all these organisms are effective in the field because they are acting by contact. There are multiple factors involved in their uh, contact killing and therefore uh, there is no resistance development etc. But I'm not going to stop with only microorganisms. There are two different products which are important in the microbials. One is the enzymes. What are the enzymes? Enzymes are the uh, proteins, we can say, that which hydrolyze protective covers of insect paste and fungal pathogens. And uh, what are the, the different components? We are, go we are going in detail a little later. That uh, the, in the protective cover, that is cuticle of insect is having chitin, protein, lipids, etc. While in fungal, again the fungal cell wall, it is again the chitin base. So these enzymes, so chitinase, protease, lipases, are important in hydrolyzing protective cover. And there are enzyme inhibitors also. 
that means these are certain metabolites produced by bacteria as well as produced by plants and this can enzyme inhibitors they can target the enzymes which are essential for the growth of the fungus or insect differentiation especially in case of fungus and insect and virulence of the pathogens so these are the three different uh, what should i say the uh, areas where we can have developed the biocontrol agents but we are not going to stop here how to use all this effectively in the field so what are the novel approaches for the better performance efficacy cost effectiveness farmers friendly uh, or uh, where we can have less labor cost wide spectrum wide spectrum is another uh, buzzword i can say that instead of only having one insecticide one fungicide one viricide etc can we have one product which can be used in the field for to or in the nursery to control all uh, pests and pathogens in the single crop system so that is wide spectrum we are going to talk about this one also and value addition just now i mentioned that while controlling say insect pests in the field using say bivaria metarrhiza the value addition is that they are also having the growth promoting activities so that is the value addition to uh, such type of products so what are the novel approaches what are the emerging trends what we can do i mean everybody knows about metarrhizum bivaria can we have formulation with multi strain or multi species or multi genera because uh, now the trend is that especially in sugar cane we can use um, to control the white grub we can have the two different organisms like bivaria metarrhizum so this is the no new approach we can say that it is not don't depend on only on one organism why because these organisms they have different mechanisms of action to control or to kill the insect pest so this is always important and that's why i mentioned initially that we have our own 50 strains metarrhizum strains depending on the host uh, we can use the combination of these strains of course you you should have some individual registrations of this type of strains application with microorganism is one thing and along with enzyme mixture and enzyme inhibitors why enzyme mixture and enzyme inhibitors sequentially or in combination this enzyme mixture just now i mentioned about the cuticle degrading enzymes these enzymes initially they will soften the cuticle and then your organism say for example metarrhizum metarrhizum conidia or metarrhizum spores they can germinate they can penetrate very easily the uh, cuticle and go inside the insect so thus enzyme mixture is useful and this this we have already done trials especially in the for the control of mealybug thrips and jasid etc where we have done this combination enzyme sequentially enzyme mixture and then the metarrhizum and it works well and it gives better control and better yield enzyme inhibitors for example nicomycin nicomycin is the in um, inhibitor of enzyme chitin synthase if you have that sort of inhibitor along with your preparation that will inhibit the chitin synthesis in the cuticle or in the fungal cell wall or if you if you want to have say chitinase inhibitor the alozomidin this uh, this is chitinase inhibitor this also stops the activity of the growth of the fungus or insect insect cuticle so these are the combinations so now one is thinking about that instead of using only one micro microorganism or one biocontrol agent we should have the combination either sequentially or in combination we can use this type of products integrated pest management i need not tell you about this that uh, along with microbials you can have plant extract etc and you can reduce down the chemicals also if you are going to use in the field or in the nursery you can reduce down the concentration by doing ipm uh, nano bio pesticides or uh, that is our main topic today's topic that how we can use this nano biotechnology in agriculture now this trend has also come in the <clears throat> agriculture that we should use nano why nano that one we will discuss later and the last is the disease suppression side forget about controlling measures etc can we have soil where we we should suppress the disease there will not be any disease so no no worry for using any bio pesticide or something like that so these are the different approaches what we are going to discuss and talk uh, 
combination of two strains why as i mentioned the different levels of host specificity for example spodoptera nomoria is the organism which has more specificity towards spodoptera than metarhizum but metarhizum also can work against this so can we have combination of these two organism same thing is true with say bivaria and metarhizum combination as i mentioned for the white grub these are the, because they have different mechanisms they have the different enzymic and non enzymic killing components i am giving little science behind this because when you apply this one in the field you will understand why we have to do this way or why we have to use this path for example non enzymic components bivaria produces one toxic bivaricin which is killing insect pest metarhizum also produces toxin destruction it also kills insect there are enzymes like chitinases chitin deacylase chitosanases same thing is true in case of bivaria so these are the different mechanisms which can uh, give the thought that yes we can use the combination of two strains two species or two genera combination with cuticle degrading enzyme complex or mycolytic enzyme complex mycolytic enzyme complex means that the enzymes which degrade the cell wall of the fungus fungal pathogen so this enzyme mixture can initiate the attack of entomopathogen and mycopathogen and help in penetration into host body so this combination we have also tested in the field uh, for the control of mealybug powdery mildew downy mildew as well as this thrips etc thrips jacids and we found that yes this mixture also works along with the organisms like metarhizum bivaria combination with enzyme inhibitors just now i mentioned about that these are the enzyme inhibitors like chitin chitin synthase inhibitors nicomycin uh, uh, alozamidine all these enzyme or benanomycin for the manan degradation etc these enzyme inhibitors can be used in the in combination with such type of organisms now we'll go to that uh, enzyme mixture when we talk about enzyme mixture before that what are the components of the insect cuticle and the fungal cell wall you will see that the basic component is chitin in both basic structural component is chitin that is n acetyl glucosamine polymer like cellulose cellulose is glucose polymer this is n acetyl glucosamine polymer so basic structure is chitin in both then here we can find the glucan manan protein complex here we have protein lipid complex so in both the cases the enzyme mixture is same like chitinase endochitinase endochitinase in acid glucose these are the enzymes i mean i don't want to go into mechanism of these enzymes but this type of mixture is important to kill the insect or to degrade the protective cover of both pathogens as well as insect uh, cutic um, uh, insect pest and thus we can use this enzyme mixture like uh, chitinolytic enzymes lipases proteases glucanases mannanase endovirus all the, these enzymes are important in cell wall degradation these enzymes are important in cuticle degradation and overall total we can see that both the um, pest and pathogens can be controlled very easily using this type of enzyme mixture just to give the some highlight of this work uh, once we have done trials for four years uh, in one field of in grapes for the control of mealybug powdery mildew and downy mildew they have simultaneously uh, for, uh, plots for the control uh, using chemicals etc they used to have 70 sprays of these chemicals using 35 sprays of this enzyme mixture uh, we could control and we got the yield almost similar as the uh, they used to get for the chemicals so this is the way it works of course there are a lot of limitations as far as the commercialization is concerned we will talk little later maybe we will discuss so these are the different pest pathogens which can be controlled by this enzyme mixture woolly aphids mealybug heliocorpa maruca spodoptera then fungal pathogens like fusarium sclerotium even this enzyme is important in the control of uh, nematodes because in uh, this chitinase especially they affect the age egg hatching in case of nematodes and if we control nematodes certainly plant health will be better and if the plant health is better certainly we have better control of 
fungal path or other less infection of fungal pathogens uh, as well as insect pest because the plant health is plant resistance is more. And by doing nematode control, we can achieve that. Uh, Richard Feynman is a Nobel laureate. He was Nobel laureate. He got his uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. And he saw that when we reduce down the size of any molecule, we get the different properties. And that is the thing which he tried to introduce that the small molecules, but of course the name nano, nano has been given by somebody else from scientists from Japan. But he is the, Richard Feynman is the person who has identified was that nanoparticles have different types of properties. What is nano size? Nano size is one to 100 nanometer. Uh, have very high surface area to volume ratio. And these properties, physical, chemical, biological properties are different to when the material is at the normal state. And this is the idea which, which was uh, which was put forth by and uh, initially nanotechnology is in, uh, extensively used in healthcare. For example, liposomes and uh, missiles, which are used for drug delivery, size is 10 to 100 nanometer. Uh, dendrimers, two to 10 nanometer are used for drug delivery and cancer detection, diagnosis, etc. Quantum dots, these are the different types of nano, nanoparticles, we can say, and their sizes used for sensing and detection of uh, biomarkers and diagnosis, magnetic nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles. The size is around 100 nanometer, and these are being used for the molecular diagnostic and therapeutics. That is in healthcare. But what is the situation in agriculture? Nanotechnology in agriculture certainly is will be there. In 2011, we uh, wrote one review on the perspectives for nanobiotechnology enable protection and nutrition of plants. That nano fertilizers, nutrient management, nano insecticides, nano fungicides, and herbicides, and nano sensors. So these are the different areas where we can use nanotechnology in agriculture. So we'll go a little uh, deeper in this area. But what are the advantages? Advantages are the increase in the shelf life because it is uh, encapsulated or something like that. The active principle is encapsulated. Packaging, transporting, labeling, certainly when the size is reduced, volume is reduced, and we can have better type of packaging, transporting, labeling. Reduce pesticide use to vegetables, and we'll talk about this. Decrease bacterial contamination. And that is one thing when we uh, produce some, say, uh, metarhizium product in the laboratory, we find that the one liter bottle immediately it gets contaminated, something like that. So that bacterial contamination will not be there because the volume is small. Improve crop productivity with new delivery mechanisms. For example, for nano, you have to use this ULV sprayer, ultra low volume sprayer. Volume is, say, five liters, you can have one acre land. While when we use water, that is the knapsack sprayer, we need 500 uh, liter of water. So this is the scale what we are going to work with nanotechnology. So nanomaterial assist in control release of agrochemicals for nutrition. That is one thing and protection against pests and pathogens. It can be used to deliver genetic material and uh, rapid and sensitive detection of plant pathogens. In a uh, agriculture research institute, one of our student, that Dr. Bandana Burmade, she is working on this. We will talk about this later. Protection and formation of soil structure, and this is important point is the, about the microbial diversity. Now there are two different aspects about a nano. Uh, there are certain nanoparticles which affect microbial diversity negatively, and there are certain nanoparticles which affect the microbial diversity positively. So. This one, we have to identify which type of nanoparticles we are going to use in the field. Development of biosensor is another aspect. Now, first is pesticide delivery, fertilizer delivery. For this, you can have different types of nanoparticles, um, right from porous holosilica, then uh, polycaprolactone, solid lipids, etc. Then PVP, all this, nanosilica. All these materials or starch, itosan, gold, all these materials we can use for the 
delivery of fertilizers as well as pesticides or even for bio pesticides uh, we can have sensors also where we can have the sensors gold nano sensor for carbofuran ddt etc then we have a zirconium oxide sensor for organophosphates or pyrethroid iron oxide of course this is uh, i can say that little beyond proof of concept proof of concept is there and we find that in addition to that one we have to go to the field so at least these areas have a lot of potential and it is it will be easier for the people to see that uh, uh, to identify the different pesticide residues in the soil as well as to identify the pathogens etc in the plant as well as in the soil and thus it will be useful to have the control measures as early as possible now why do fertilizer perform poorly in fields or nurseries this is the question i don't know whether they they are really poorly working but it is a theoretical question so theoretical answer is that fertilizers are made by chemists chemical engineers and industrial processing technologies etc so they have certain ideas of the physical and chemical processes for example if we mix say ferrous sulfate and zinc sulfate what happens so that that is the look out of the chemi uh, chemist but we need if we want to make a good fertilizer we need in uh, of the inputs from the plant physiologists as well as agroecologists if such type of inputs are there then we can have the rational behind the developing any fertilizer combination and thus we can go for the use of fertilizers uh, but we can have the novel ways uh, this uh, that is the nano nano fertilizers now uh, this is one uh, aspect which one has to think why nano population is a uh, around 2004 it was 6 billion now by 2050 it will be 12 billion there will not be any increase in the agriculture land rather because of urbanization land is going down and down and uh, for that one we have to use the technology which can serve the purpose and what is the purpose that the uh, reduce the losses due to excessive use of fertilizers and other chemicals or bioagents so what is the rationale of applying nanotechnology the population is increasing climate is changing making agriculture hard to do and the economic projections uh, show that we need double the quantity of food material by 2050 so for that one we have to use some technology and that is nanotechnology now how to apply this nanotechnology for fertilizers either foliar sprays of uh, nanoparticles or adding the nano fertilizer in root zone there are certain complications also when we add in the root zone sometimes aggregation of nano particles there then the property changes etc but one has to do the some uh, field experiment to check the uh, nano products which are produced in the laboratory so how it works usually nano is mobilized either apoplastic that means outside cell membrane that is in periplasmic space cell wall and cell membrane there is one space where different enzymes are also present like chitinase etc and this in this space and uh, symplastic pathway that is the through cytoplasm so these are the two different uh, ways and the internalization preferentially by endocytosis and uh, translocation is through xylem and phloem so there are different types of nano composite polymers which can be used which can bind nutrients to improve efficacy more than the controlled release of fertilizers and nano composite polymer can be used nano biosensors as i mentioned that these are necessary uh, for the to check the release of nutrient just in time in the rhizosphere and for that one you need sensors and to amend the soil samples with nano clays again we can have the delays in nitro uh, it can reduce down the delays in nitrate loaded runoff and release of ammonia and nitrous oxide so these are the main concerns as far as the uh, nano fertilizers are concerned but the main concerns uh, application is one thing and main concern is that the toxicity is associated with nanoscale material now i am coming back to the original that 
think that whether nano material is affecting any other diversity so this is the thing why it it, it is it might affect because toxicity associated with nano scale material nano means it will have very small size say less than 50 nanometer and it can easily go into the male through the cell membrane and thus can affect the useful diversity also comparatively less nano fertilizer research with key crop nutrients and this is i think the key for the future research that you identify the crops you identify the nursery crops which are uh, which need such type of technology then we can certainly develop some nano fertilizers so for that one inadequate soil or field based studies with nano fertilizers so that is another concern so we need more and more for the registration purpose which types of nano materials are suitable to produce nano fertilizer and that this is this is again the important aspect uh, that uh, there are certain biopolymers which can be used which will be grass clear that means generally regarded as safe and how to efficient and effectively apply nano fertilizers at the field scale and finally the economics of nano fertilizers i think maybe development cost will be little more but uh, after ap application cost will be less now there are different metals metal nanoparticles like zinc oxide nanoparticle silica iron titanium oxide then uh, gold nano rods uh, al aluminum oxide uh, then iron oxide all these nano particles are um, uh, there which can be used eventually in the field especially the cerium oxide nano particles display many bio relevant activities which may make enzymes like superoxide dismutase catalase peroxidase oxidase and phosphatase all these are important especially in the uh, uh controlling the production of different radicals etc and thus it can be used in the field very well nano lucite fertilizer for slow release of nitrogen or the nitrate fertilizer and potassium aluminum silicate this is the lucite nano particles can be used along with the calcium ammonium nitrate so there are now some trials are going on and at present three types of products nano nitrogen nano zinc and nano copper are being tested in the field by by different companies and hope i think we'll get some uh, nano fertilizers uh, for the for regular application now we'll go to nano pesticides why do we really need nano pesticides that is the question what is the regular use of indian indian agrochemical consumption indian agrochemical consumption is around 0.58 kg per hectare usa they are using 4.5 kg per hectare while in japan it is 11 kg per hectare but when we say that 0.58 kg this is huge because our agriculture land is also huge so naturally this is alarming situation as far as the agrochemical consumption is concerned chemical pesticide still everywhere it is being used and around 66 billion dollar us dollars is the um, industry of chemical pesticides while bio pesticide is still very less 6.6 billion us dollar while uh, micro pesticide etc fungal as i am interested in more fungal products 0.66 billion but when we use these chemicals we find that the actual utilization on the target is less than 0.1% if we do spraying say area spray for example we find that the spray drift rain water leaching etc so what is this 99.9% where it goes it can increase pathogen and pest resistance so this is one thing which is important then it reduces soil diversity then diminishes nitrogen fixation especially this is the important activity in soil by symbiotic organisms as well as non symbiotic organism causes decline decline of pollinators and destroys bird habitats so what nano does a precise release of the necessary and sufficient amount of active ingredients that is important and that nano pesticides can do <clears throat> so nano materials can also be used for pesticide and bio pesticide degradation for example gold nano flowers can exhibit catalytic activity to degrade herbicide 
Usually we use herbicide in the field. So that is herbicide is pendimethalin. So or zinc oxide nano rods can catalyze photocatalyte degradation of organophosphorus pesticides. So if somebody is using this type of pesticides, maybe I can also use these nanomaterials for the degradation of such type of harmful pesticide or polymers based nano formulations which can degrade a bifen thrilling uh, in soil. So there are different methods for the synthesis of nanoparticles. I'm not going to go into detail, but there are some chemical based methods, but there are eco-friendly eco biological sources also can be used for the greener and safer synthesis of nanomaterial. For example, antimicrobial silver nanoparticles can be synthesized using organisms like Seracea, Metaregium, and Bivaria. Seracea is the organism which is being, which is the first organism which has been identified as chitinase producer, this enzyme, and it was used in the um, along with other biocontrol agents in the uh, for the control of this Magna Portha uh, fungus, fungal pathogen in rice. Metarism behavior, of course, you know everything about that, these two organisms and number of other fungi. So we can use this fungal organism for the synthesis of silver <laughs> nanoparticles. Antibacterial zinc oxide nanoparticles can be produced using leaf extract of different plants. While rice husk biomass can be used for the graphene uh, quantum dots production and which can be used in the field. Now, when we talk about zinc oxide nanoparticles, there are two different aspects. One is promotion of seed germination, root and shoot length, so etc. in different plants, as well as it is also effective in controlling pathogens like Fusarium, Botrytis cinerea, Aspergillus, Pseudomonas, etc. In addition to that one, if we want to have the insect control, we can have Bt uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles, which can control the pulse beetles also by different ways and by affecting their enzyme activities, etc. Titanium is biocompatible, but it is not really essential nutrient. But titanium oxide nanoparticles, they can increase starch and gluten contents of wheat, of course, uh, and then reduces pathogenic bacteria. Uh, silver, nano, uh, sorry, iron nanoparticles with eucalyptus extract can be used for two aspects, antifungal activities as fusarium, rhizoctonia, all these root in, uh, affecting fungi can be controlled, as well as it can enhance the root elongation and pho photosynthetic potential of different crops. And also it can have the antifederant activity against diamond back moth. Silver nanoparticles useful as a nutrient and help in controlling plant pathogens. Now, what is the fate of nanoparticles in the soil? There are two different aspects. One is in presence of uh, sunlight, we can see the photodegradation of this coating or oxidation has also been seen or the self sulfidation is seen. So if you want to maintain these nanoparticles as nanoparticles in the soil, you have to control all these other factors. Now, there are different, other than metals, there are different polymers which can be used to make the nano formulations. For example, chitosan, alginate, polyhydro. Chitosan is nothing but like chitin. It is glucosamine polymer. Alginate is calcium alginate. Then polyhydroxybutyrate, it is again one actinomycid product. Polylactate, it is fungal product. So this can be used to make the nano formulation of different uh, active ingredients, either plant extract or enzymes or any other enzyme inhibitors, etc. So these biopolymers, what they do? They can protect uh, different uh, products. Like as I mentioned, that neem, uh, neem oil can be uh, protected from degradation. Then its storage stability can be increased, decreased cost, control release can be seen at the site, etc. Nano emulsions and nano encapsulation of ingredients like citronella species to control the uh, vascular streak dieback disease of cocoa. Uh, bacillus thuris Bt toxin as a nanoparticle can give a persistent and more effectiveness for the insect pest control. Chitosan nanoparticles functionalize with beta cyclodextrin containing carvacrol. This is again fungicide. Uh, exhibits, of course, this is natural source fungicide. Exhibit insecticidal activity against Heliborpa armigera and 
tetranicus uh, uh, urtiki with increased stability slow release etc so this is the um, uh, advantage of these uh, biopolymers like kytosan alginate etc uh, there are different uh, just little information because we are working on this aspect uh, that synthesis of kytosan nare particles they can use with use of some cross linkers for example there are different cross linkers like citric acid genepin etc and this one at present we are using for the entrapment of our enzyme solution we can have so have we are also working with alginate kytosan nanoparticles where the um, yeah, this is a calcium alginate nanoparticles is a by mixing two calcium chloride and sodium alginate we can make the nanoparticle this is the first method of immobilization of enzyme uh, soluble enzyme and uh, this one now at present people are using to make the uh, nanoparticles and this solution is important for the entrapment of different enzymes or enzyme inhibitors on plant extracts this is our main area of the cuticle degrading and mycolytic enzyme complex can be used as wide spectrum biocontrol agent and uh, we have seen that the soluble enzyme certainly works well in the field that uh, having the pre enzymes like chitinase protease lipases etc and different fungi they uh, produce such type of enzymes and this enzyme mixture can be used to control different pests and pathogens as i mentioned earlier so we can have differential immobilization of these enzymes say lipase chitin etc depending on the pest uh, present in the field and for example lipase enzyme shows higher binding with chitosan nanoparticles while endochitin that is a chitin degrading enzyme uh, shows higher binding with alginate chitosan nanoparticles the so why i am specifically mentioning these two because in case of millibug you know that there is a white coating on the millibug and that white coating is nothing but the waxy coating that is a lipid material so you need more lipase activity to first hydrolyze that waxy coating then the organism is exposed and then other enzymes can work on that one while in case of uh, say helicorpa or sporoptera we find that the endochitinase uh, is important then in that case alginate chitosan nanoparticles are uh, can be used because this endochitinase can act on the cuticle chitin and then eventually it can kill the uh, insect pest so this is the differential immobilization is important for all the enzymes like protease lipase chitinase etc and because of that one we can have the selective inhibition so uh, killing of insect pest or pathogens so uh, what this nano formulation can do in this nano formulation increases temperature stability and shelf life of the enzyme preparation and also useful to slow and sustain release of enzymes especially in soil now we have done some work on this one we have tried in the field also for the control of the fusarium uh, as well as uh, we have done some uh, laboratory experiments for the control of the pink millibug and we found that the uh, there is a lot of potential of this differential immobilization of lipases and this endochitinases for the control of say fusarium wilt also in different plant crops as well as for the control of the millibug like organism millibug has that waxy coating same we have seen in case of woolly aphid but that woolly mass is little loose so it can easily be uh, removed but it is always better that we can hydrolyze that one so that protection of woolly aphid also can be removed using such type of nanoparticles uh, i mentioned about the ari project it is uh, this dr vandana varmade she is working on this and they are using on the, the nano formulation against helicorpa armigera and of course they they are using some ds rna that is the um, double stranded rna which can be used uh, for the um, inhibition of the growth here you will find that there is effect on the pupation the formation of the pupa also and thus this can be this uh, uh, si rna what is called that silencing rna so uh, this silencing rna can be used for the control of helicorp armigera and uh, recently they have also got the patent of this type of activity 
now uh, these na nano formulations can be uh, used or this um, rather uh, biopolymer nano formulations can be used like storage based control using garlic essential oil or uh, we can have the polyethylene glycol coated nanoparticles for slow release of nutrients or nanostructure alumina can be used uh, especially for the space control in storehouses and amorphous silica can be used uh, as a uh, safe material for the um, for the soil application so this type of nanoparticles carbon silver silica etc can be used in the field and they have a lot of potential there is one additional aspect i was mentioning about some sensing or sensors biosensors for the early detection of the pathogen and this is this is the one project which we have along with agarkar research institute where we are using this uh, uh, dna biosensors uh, which can be made using uh, this gold nanoparticles and the uh, uh, dna strands which can identify the pathogen and this is again with agarkar research institute what we are trying to see that these are the obligate pathogens like powdery mildew in grapes downy mildew grapes or powdery mildew in tomato we find that the this if we want to control this first we have to identify these organisms and this is the dna based uh, based uh, approach which can be used um, um, using gold nanoparticles for the identification or the for a detection of this path, early detection of the pathogen in the uh, plant system and then eventually we are um, you are trying to use this enzyme nano formulation against this pathogen by encapsulation in as i mentioned that in chitosan or the chitosan alginate beads etc and because when we make the nano it can very well enter into the cell system uh, easily now the last part which is important according to me rather more important is that nano nano particles and the microbial diversity Uh, usually when as, as i mentioned that when the 50 nanometers nanometer size is there it can penetrate the cell very easily and the it can affect the conductivity of cytoplasm and eventually we can see the death of the cell most of the metal and metal oxides show antimicrobial activity by mechanism of endocytosis attachment to the membrane or maybe catalyze radical formation or release of metal ions in the cell so these are the two mechanisms on the which affect even useful bacterial community also but there are certain nanoparticles like three types of nano carbon nanomaterials like graphene graphene oxide and carbon nanotubes they can increase all soil microarthropods so that is the observation or that is the maybe proof of concept research has been seen but this is interesting thing where one has to think about that which type of nanoparticles when you we use what is the diversity whether macro diversity or microbial diversity changes in the soil so we can have the uh, different types of um, nanoparticles a positive impact on the taxa which are involved in the decomposition of organic pollutants and biopolymers so this is one aspect and there are certain metal oxide nanoparticles are toxic to the microbial community as compared to the organic nanoparticles such as fullerenes etc so one certainly can go with organic nanoparticles than the metal nanoparticles which are better as far as the soil micro microbial diversity is concerned alginate chitosan or uh, uh, other chitosan uh, and uh, tripolyphosphate um, um, capsulation to herbicides etc also affects bac bacterial diversity but it increases the proportion of bacteria having nitrogen fixing capacity i don't know why what sort of observations um, this people have taken but uh, certainly they must they must have taken the nitrogen um, fixing capacity of the organisms etc in the plant or they must have estimated a nitrogen in the plant but uh, it is it is always better that one should really do the experiments and try to a single uh, organism experiments and try to see whether this is true so what is the sort analysis what are the strength weaknesses opportunities and threats of nano ease of application because volume is low increase in shelf life reduction in load of pesticides improve the protection of biodiversity 
in most of the cases possible reduction in application cost eventually because number of uh, sprays etc even can be reduced off weakness is high production cost initially legislative uncertainties and acceptability by the farming community and this is one thing number of times i have find that the farmers if we say that it is you just take one ml why one ml he will take the 2 ml or 3 ml like that so so this is the some um, uh, for that one we need uh, some sort of education also how to use this nano biotechnology in agriculture and eventually farming community will also accept this because it is very easy to apply opportunities protection of the environment plants and human health and microbial diversity and organic toxic residues are not there in the in the farming because quantity if at all we use for say pesticide quantity is very low threats increase in stability for long duration can affect non target organisms and i think this is the thing which has prompted most of the regulatory bodies to think rethink uh, of use of nano in the in agriculture for example Uh, this regulatory body has suggested small volumes of nano product their slow release and longer duration effects same could increase the risk to beneficial or communities in addition to their effects on crop health and soil microbial diversity the risk to human health is also a major concern in united states um, united states environmental protection agency they have formulated some certain rules for registration especially for nano pesticides and at present they have approved only one nano pesticide for laundry use and that contains a composite of nano silver and nano scale silica that was approved in 2011 uh, as far as uh, central insecticide board in india is concerned so far there are no um, uh, regulatory guidelines uh, for the nano formulation now the last aspect that okay i mean one thing is that what are the different as approaches one can use to use bio fertilizers and bio pesticides another thing is it can we have the disease suppressive soil so management of soil borne disease is critical in greenhouse and especially in nurseries so pathogens like pythium rhizoctonia and uh, phytophthora fusarium these are they affect regularly in nurseries so can we have disease suppressive potting mix there are different potting mix mix uh, mixtures suppressive so organic amendments light peat moss not a dark fissure dark peat moss usually support the pathogen growth but light peat moss and good quality compost like bark compost can be used inoculating compost and or potting media with microbial bio pesticides such as trichoderma gliocladium bacillus and pseudomonas and use that material in the pots inoculating potting media with plant health promoting microorganisms such as mycorrhiza and this is new area where one can really add on as far as the nurseries are concerned mycorrhiza because they have specific interaction or host specific interaction so certainly this will be useful and uh, all these organisms they works by nutritional competition and antibiotics because number of organism they produce antibiotics so naturally the pathogens are killed trichoderma for example is mycoparasitic or organism or gliocladium is also mycoparasitic organism so these organisms can control fungal pathogen very well in the soil so thus you can have the disease suppressive soil again here i want to add one comment that it is not disease free soil it is disease suppressive soil why this is suppressive soil is necessary and why not this is free soil because if it is this is free soil other pathogens or other organisms which are otherwise saprophytic they can become um, pathogenic to the plants because it is the shifting of pest and shifting of pathogens so that sort of observation has been seen in number of cases i i just want to lastly i just want to give one comment um, uh, about this the shifting of pest Uh, when we were we started working on this nano formulation about the enzyme based nano formulation and uh, we wanted to control helicorpa uh, then uh, at the time of presentation in dbt um, you you know the person professor puri from he was vice chancellor of prahuri he was chairman he said that uh, your concept is good but uh, in cotton now there is no helicorpa there is a 
space is shifted from helicorpa that time it was millibug and eventually it has shifted to thrips so this shifting of paste why shifting of paste is occurring because of bt cotton the helicorpa control was 100% so naturally in bt cotton we found that the millibug is taking up so like that shifting of paste is uh, observed shifting of pathogens is observed number of times saprophytic organisms are also becoming pathogenic so it is advisable that we should have only disease suppression and not the disease free and i think with this comment i would like to thank of course the organizers for giving me this opportunity of expressing myself about the nano uh, bio nano technology or nano biotechnology how we can use in agriculture i have written one chapter in this book also this now about the nano bio pesticides and uh, certainly i would like to acknowledge the dbt bayrak and dst the dsr because that's why we can do some r and d activities also in our company and of course dr vandana gurmade who uh, who is my student as well as now she is independent scientist so we are working on the nano formulations and dr santosh tupe uh, again director green vision biotech and thank you so much for your patient listening thank you sir. thank you very much deshpandesh for sharing a very valuable information valuable knowledge with all our participants thank you very much once again now this forum is open for participants any question to our speaker deshpandesh sir they are free to ask their question is there any question from the participants for deshpandesh sir once again i am asking to for participants those who have any question they are free to ask for speaker even you can put may, your question yeah, in the may, chat also yeah may, maybe i can i add like this that uh, if uh, maybe at this point they they don't have any question so but they can my email address is there in the presentation so maybe they can write if they have any question and i am that way quite available for uh, solving their problems if i can uh dr ben has raised his hand uh, dr ben can can you ask your please ask your question yes sir sir uh, myself dr yeah. ben kail and i am a microbiologist and i have been working for bio industry uh, for uh, production of biofertilizers and also biopesticides so in the one you have shared like uh, you have shared that we can spray enzymes we can use enzymes for control of uh, i mean uh, organisms and what would be the exact dosage or what is that exactly recommended what is the concentration that you would suggest that is one question uh, now there are t- there are two things that the concentration is dependent on the how much protein is there number one so that is the pro- protein concentration and the enzyme activity because when we talk about enzyme it is not the only protein concentration it is the enzyme activity so you, you need to have this enzyme mixture having say for example i'm i'm just giving one example say um, for the millibug control if you want yeah. to use yeah. that uh, for millibug control this enzyme mixture say uh, you have to have the basic unit say minimum two international units of chitinase activity is necessary mm-hmm. now how to how to calculate that activity is also important number of times i find that the people are just doing this uh, i hope that you are very comfortable with enzymeology no yeah Are, are you comfortable with enzymeology? No. Sure, 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 sir. You can, you can. Yeah. So, uh, number of times, see, if you estimate the chitinase activity, you can estimate by DNSA method. That is dinitrosalicylic acid method. You can estimate chitinase activity using Sommelier-Nielsen method. It is another reagent. You can estimate chitinase activity in acetyl glucosamine estimation. So these are the different levels of activities. You can see. so when i say that two international units of enzyme activity that is with the highest one that is the n acetyl glucosamine use so so the, that sort of so you need to identify the culture filtrate which has this chitinase activity another thing is that uh, what is the level of protease activity again if you have some protease activity in this protease activity can also degrade your chitinase because chitinase is protein so it can degrade so you have to have some critical balance of protease activity chitinase activity and lipase activity so these are the three main activities there are another pathway also the chitosanase and chitin deacetylase so these are the different enzymes 
maybe if you want i can send my couple of papers to you you can oh. just go to that one and then you write to me on that email yeah. address and i can send you the paper um, uh, paper that chitin dsl how it works chitin dsl is and chitosanase it's often it dsl is the chitin of the protective cover and thus then chitosanase acts on that one and then organism can penetrate so these are the basic activities of enzymes but you need to have the cocktail which is having the different pro exact proportion which will not affect each other okay okay and one more question is like yeah i actually wanted to ask the same question in the previous sessions also it is regarding usage of bio pesticides in this nursery sector because it's like any bio pesticide or any product similar product it comes comes under cib as of the present yes. regulation yes and uh, when this is under cib and when it is uh, you know particularly used in agricultural sector only and uh, is that anything that you know it will be helpful for the nursery sector because nursery uh, i mean uh, are these people able to use this uh, bio pesticides because is there any helpful method or uh, any flexibility kind of thing you have to have the cib registration for all the bio pesticides so that is that is there so there is no yes. uh, way out for nursery separately so you have to have the cib registration and fortunately for we have the cib registration for different uh, this bivaria metarizium uh, trichoderma yes, yes. and other products also so you have CIB... and everything and even for pgpr also it is there but is yes. there any flexibility that uh, you know uh, Uh, apart from the agriculture sector uh, uh, either from the ina or uh, um, from ina if there would be any uh, i mean request that at least this nursery people uh, can use this uh, i mean uh, can use this at uh, at times without this regulatory you know uh, barriers i doubt really but i have to find out but 99% it is doubtful because see it is not the nursery and uh, we are not separating nursery and agriculture finally uh, it is the bio pesticide and so or pesticide for pesticide also we have to have these re different regulations so maybe i think the same thing must be true with bio pesticide but i will try to find out is there any way out for this and maybe i will let you know okay thank you very much thank you very much desh pandey sir Mm, i think uh, there is one question can you please re explain this is suppressive soil suppressive soil yeah uh, see there are uh, yeah this is suppressive soil this is suppressive soil in the soil uh, when we want to test any bio pesticide usually what we do we have this is sick soil that means for example if you want to control the fusarium wheat or something like that we make the fusary uh, infection more and more and then thus that is that becomes a disease sensitive soil or this is uh, the uh, disease soil this is soil so this is suppressive soil means usually in the soil there are organisms like rhizoctonia fusarium uh, and uh, sclerotium rolsi all these organisms are present in the soil and depending on the available condition and host immediately they become pathogenic to the plants so such type of soils are there in that case how to control these organisms for example sclerotium and say rhizoctonia if these organisms are there you add trichoderma in the soil if trichoderma population is more even for fusarium also trichoderma population is more in the soil naturally they can mycoparasitize these organisms and they can control the infection uh, so th th that is the idea so first if you want to make disease suppressive soil try to analyze the soil for the microbial load what are the different organisms present in the soil and depending on that one you can make a cocktail of different useful organisms and you can add in that one so thus these organisms they will also uh, proliferate they will also grow in the soil and when they grow in the soil either they will produce antibodies for example pseudomonas produces cedarophor which can control other pathogens so like that you can have the uh, different organisms which have this antibodies mechanism 
also they have some mycoparasitic mechanism etc and thus you can control the disease and for that one as i mentioned that the in the, especially this is useful for the nurseries because when you make such type of uh, mixture in for the pot certainly it will be useful and there will not be any infection per se of the soil so you can use that comp uh, uh, compost very well uh, for growing the um, uh, plants in the nursery so this is this is separation and as i mentioned that it is not the uh, this is free because if you remove this is maybe trichoderma can become pathogenic because it it has is oh, everything is there so like that don't make this is free it is this is separate so that means let uh, some fusarium should be there some say i am i'm just giving example some rhizoctonia is there which is having the low number or lower number as compared to the regular soil where the fusarium has higher number like that so this is the separation thank you very much sir i think you have touched all the aspects of uh, emerging biofertilizers and biocontrol strategies for nursery uh, rightly said about the nanotechnology and i hope this webinar will be more fruitful and helpful uh, for all of our nursery men all the participants even i have shared the deshpande sir's uh, mobile number in the chat ring him and uh, they can ask their question so thank you very much sir for yes. sparing thank your you valuable so time with all of us and thank you so much for giving this opportunity and if anybody is having any uh, uh, queries they can certainly contact me on email or maybe on mobile so i can uh, certainly be happy to one answer. question sir hello yeah please please ask your question uh this is very nice information sir you are just uh, touching the nanotechnology in agriculture but i want to ask one question sir uh, if you are applying the, this nano pesticide in the field condition uh, can we see any bioaccumulation biomagnification in the food web uh, food chain can can be it will be hamp can be it will be hamper on the food chain or food web sir because because as i mentioned that the quantity which you are using is very less whenever we use pesticides regular pesticides 99% goes into water or goes into soil without any use so it is always better that when we use nano nano formulation the quantity is less i was just giving example of this uh, when we made the enzyme formulation we used to have for one uh, acre land we use only 5 liters of the uh, that enzyme nano formulation while for the control soluble enzymes when we use we we used around uh, 250 liters of water with enzyme so this is the scale so naturally we see that the nano formulation is not will not be that yaman kar sir can i ask one question yes let let me finish uh, his answer sir please 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 so, wait so so then uh, then in that case only problem is that uh, as i said that it is the nano nano size then second one is long duration and the uh, shelf life is more long duration because of that one it should not affect non target organisms there are certain reports which affect they are affect non target organisms uh, negatively there are certain reports where they affect non target organisms positively that means uh, uh, this is the uh, this is the aspect that's why the cib regulations are important for the use of nano formulation but so far they are not any given regulation but as i understand recently from the state government has given permission for three bio for uh, nano bio fertilizers that is copper nitrogen and phosphorus okay. thank you thank you so uh, there is one there is one more question from the dr digambar mokat sir uh, digambar mokat sir please ask your question sir hmm. uh respected deshpande sir uh thanks for giving a nice talk on nanotechnology sir my uh, i have a two questions uh sir in the nursery uh, usually the plants they are propagated sexually and asexually and uh, at the time of propag propagation usually the hormones they are used for rooting or for breaking the dormancy of the seeds can we use any nano material for enhancing the rooting and breaking the dormancy this is my first question and second question 
actually at the time of sowing of the seed uh, usually the deterioration of the seed is takes place uh, the seed they are takes place uh, when they sown in the soil can we use any bio material to stop the deterioration of the soil so in first question i uh, i have mentioned in one of the slides that zinc oxide nanoparticles iron oxide nanoparticles they have some positive effect on the seed germination as well as the root and shoot length especially feeding roots are increased etc so there are certain nanoparticles which can be used again these are the observation in certain crops i don't know can we generalize this statement as far as the nurseries are concerned but one has to do the experiments of different on the different crops in the nursery and then only we can comment on this one but there are reports especially for soybeans and zinc oxide nanoparticles they increase the root length and the feeding roots etc so so the, these are the effects people have seen these are the proof of concept i can say uh, but so far the in the field experiments i mean i i'm also not very much sure about this now as far as the uh, what is the second thing that bio um, you mentioned about the bio accumulation now no seed deterioration can we stop this seed deterioration with the help of nanoparticle yes for by seed coating you can stop that one you you can have the nano material at, for example uh, see kytosan kytosan is the polymer thin film it can form the thin film and we can the protect seeds as well as the fruit material very easily using the kytosan films etc so you can have the kytosan nanoparticle and which can be used for the protection i mean this is again the reported fact i have not done any experiment independently myself as far as this aspect is concerned but these are the reports which we have people have shown that the kytosan nano nano material can be used for the seed protection दिगंबर सर एनी क्वेश्चन मोर क्वेश्चन सर नो सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू ब्राह्मण कर सर थैंक यू देश पांडे सर इज देर एनी मोर क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द पार्टिसिपेंट्स एनी मोर क्वेश्चन आई थिंक वी आर ऑलमोस्ट ऑन क्लोजिंग टाइम इज अप नाउ वंस अगेन आई एम थैंकफुल टू देश पांडे सर फॉर गिविंग वैल्यूएबल टाइम टू इंडियन नर्सरीमैन एसोसिएशन his guidance always be valuable for all the indian nursery men thank you very much sir for giving the thank you very much sir for today's talk i am also thankful to our participants for sparing their valuable time with all of us once again we have the next webinar on the the art and technique of arranging floor design on 12th august 2000 2021 so thank you for all of us for joining with us till then have a nice time thank you very much thank you so much yes sir hello yeah uh, email ka upar bhejne bataya sir desh pande sir please put your email in chat email id और एक था ओके यस सर ओके थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू